I have come to know and love many of you through the recent close relationship of Rescue Mission and MANA. I'm delighted that Pam Ferguson is here today. Pam, stand up just for a moment. Pam runs our kitchen, and so she's the one doing that big pancake breakfast every Saturday morning, and some of you have worked with her. Um, and with Back to School Blast, and with some of you, it goes back even further for decades. The Rescue Missions will be starting its 68th year in July, and some of you have been volunteering and working at the Rescue Mission for, for decades, and I thank you for that. And it's such a delightful experience to be able to be here and to worship with you. Before we look at the text I've chosen for today, I want to offer you a couple of explanations, just two. Today is a holiday. My children and I were talking several years ago that holidays are sometimes the loneliest and most difficult days for some of us. My husband was buried four years ago today on Mother's Day. So for me, it's a day I remember him as well as I remember my mother and my grandmother. John had taken a fall on the ice. Some of you read about that in the paper on December 27th, right between Christmas and New Year's, which happened to be the day of our 36th wedding anniversary. On New Year's Eve, we were in trauma, ICU, where his brain bleed continued to get worse following surgery. On Valentine's Day, he had another setback at the Shepherd Center in Atlanta, where we'd gone seeking help for his swelling brain. And on Easter Sunday, his brain died. Ten days later, his heart stopped. We buried him on Mother's Day. I told the kids, I don't want anybody to mess with Groundhog's Day, because it's about the only holiday I have left that doesn't have trauma or sadness attached to it. Today is Mother's Day. It's a holiday, some would say, that's engineered by Hallmark and Lady Godiva Chocolates and Estee Lauder, but I prefer to believe that it's the one day that we embrace the ideal of motherhood. For many of us who had godly mothers, we remember her on this day and we share the hope found in Hebrews 12 where it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. The verse goes on about racing and other things, and you should invite somebody from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes to come and do a, a men's day service on that, but I like the first part, the cloud of witnesses, because for many of us, our mothers, our grandmothers, significant women in our lives are in that cloud of witnesses because they were the first ones to tell us about Jesus. It's true. Mother's Day is a very difficult day for the pastor and a good day to have a visiting preacher <laughs> because a good pastor often knows the backstory of the people in the congregation and knows that this day when we celebrate mothers who loved and nurtured us and we pay special attention to the oldest mother and the newest mother and the mother with the most children, the list just goes on and on and on. We know that not every child has been blessed with a nurturing mother. Some of us were born to mothers who were not equipped to do the job. Some of us were born to mothers who were not called to be mothers and for one reason or another were absent when we needed them the most. Mother's Day, for some of us, can bring up emotions, disappointment, sorrow, anger, fear, bring up emotions that we've not thought about in days or months or even years, and we don't welcome those emotions. And so today, I ask those of you who were blessed with godly mothers who loved you with their whole hearts to be aware of your brothers and sisters who do not share that experience. I believe one of the most wonderful things about being a follower of Jesus is that God can use even the worst things to teach us and to reach us and bless us. That God can fill in the empty places. And for that reason, I want to share with you on Mother's Day a bit of an old song that may be a blessing to some of you that are struggling with this day, which is a day of celebration for so many. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel 
like a marvelous child. Sometimes I feel like a marvelous child a long way from home a long Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me to stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am warm. The storm through the night. Lead me on, Lord, lead me to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me. A second explanation. I'm wearing traditional Pakistani dress today because I just returned yesterday from a preaching mission with Betty Davis in Pakistan where Christians live with the daily pressure of repression and hostility. In Pakistan, it is dangerous to be a Christian. Women, in particular, carry a heavy burden there. So today, I am wearing Pakistani dress in honor of the Christian women in Pakistan, specifically the woman who gave me this dress. As I studied the text for today, I was reminded of many of the women I met in Pakistan over the last two weeks. And so I would like to begin, before we address the text, by asking you to join me in praying for Christians everywhere, but especially Christian women in Pakistan who are living faithfully in the most dire situ situations and circumstances. Let's pray. Lord, we celebrate our freedoms. We celebrate the ability to come to a place like this and sing your praises, to be in fellowship with one another, and to celebrate that we are part of the family of Christ. And yet, Lord, even as we celebrate our celebration is shadowed by the knowledge that there are many people around the world who do not enjoy the freedoms we enjoy. And that there are places like Pakistan where being a Christian has a cost. And so, Lord, remind us to hold up our brothers and sisters in places where being a Christian is difficult, where it's dangerous. Let us hold them up and pray for their faith to grow and for them to feel in a very real way your presence standing with them. And Lord, help us to stand wherever we are. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We're going to be looking at one story today told two times. So you're going to have to keep up, pay attention. First, it's told in Matthew 15, and this is what it says. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So the disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. 
The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed in that moment. Now the same story told in Mark, chapter 7. As soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. John told you that he became acquainted with the mission during the production of Soup, Soap, and Salvation at Mill Mountain Theater. There's a song in that production that I think fits really well with this story. So I wanted to share it with you today. See if you agree with me. Have I ever been in love this way? Oh no. Never have I ever seen such love that lifted me and made me feel so clean. This has got to talk about a mother who is a member of that cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, a woman who was a pioneer in faithfulness, 
And you're going to have to stay alert because I'm going to jump back and forth from Mark 7 to Matthew 15. But I want to encourage you to read these stories for yourself and talk about them at the dinner table. I want these stories to permeate your lives and your thoughts and your value systems and the way you treat one another. So let's begin, shall we? Let's wrestle with the text until the text wins. Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, now whenever I see the word behold in the New Testament, I'm reminded of a friend who would say, well, looky yonder. <laughs> whenever he was excited about something and you knew to pay attention, behold, it's in there that way to get our attention. Behold, look over there. A nameless woman who is described by her nationality as a Canaanite woman in Matthew and is defined by her race as a Seraphonician in Mark came out and cried, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely possessed by a demon. The scripture says Jesus did not answer her. Not a word. Some women may be attracted to the strong, silent type. I'm not. But I don't think that's what's happening here. And I appreciate people who voice considered answers, and sometimes that takes a little while, but I don't think that's what's happening here. The text says Jesus was silent. And the text says the disciples were not. His disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she keeps crying after us. So he answered in the Mark version, get in line, take your turn. If there are any leftovers, maybe I can help you. And in the Matthew version, I was sent only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Either way. It appears she was pleading for mercy, and he held her at bay. He pushed her away with his excuses. But, every good story has a but. She came and knelt before him. I see it. She knelt before him, blocking his path, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And the scripture tells us her daughter was healed instantly in that moment. I remember reading this story in seminary and asking myself, why is this in the Bible? What is the point? To inspire each of us to have great faith so that we persevere in our petitions? To make the point that Jesus has the ability to heal? To make the point that Jesus is Lord, but Lord doesn't always mean nice? Perhaps one of the greatest plagues of the church right now is that we've taken scripture and we've tried to make it nice. I gotta tell you, there's a lot of things in scripture that are not nice, and this is one of them. I know Jesus was having a rough day. I know this because the scripture tells us he was being pressed by mobs of people. He was on a hit list by the religious establishment who were getting very nervous about the new rabbi with his upside down, inside out theology. And even his closest associates, his dream team, the guys he chose by himself, handpicked, seemed to be at their best dense and at their worst an intentional obstacle to the master's plan. Yeah, Jesus was having a bad day. I get it. I have bad days. So do you. But even so, bad day and all, I don't think this is the way Jesus is supposed to act. 
this initial lack of compassion, this exploitation of power, the tone, the condensation, the rudeness of it. In the words of Ricky Ricardo, Jesus, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> you laughed, but I got to tell you, if this were the only story we had about Jesus, I'm not sure I'd be a Christian. I am not comfortable with this Jesus. Jesus in this story is rude, and that puts me in a dilemma. The first time she calls out, he ignores her completely. My Jesus does not ignore people. My Jesus is not mean. He would never, ever call somebody a dog. My Jesus is not condescending, especially to people who are in trouble. My Jesus does not agree with the cultural prejudice of the first century Jews' prayer, which went like this. You know it. Blessed art thou, O Lord God, creator of the universe, that thou didst not create me a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. She fit all three categories. My Jesus is compassionate. My Jesus is the one who listens and invites kids to sit in his lap. My Jesus is colorblind. My Jesus sees women as fully human. But to understand this story in the gospel, we need to unearth some of the clues we're given. And we also need to note the placement of the story in Matthew and in Mark. Earlier, we read, Jesus had already fed a crowd of 5,000 hungry people. And that sort of turned them into a mob. They wanted more. Then Jesus walked on water. I'd say that's a full day for any Messiah, wouldn't you? Peter, who sees Jesus walking on water, yells out, Is it really you, Lord? Then call me, and I too will walk on water. So in Matthew chapter 14, we read, Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on water. And if there were a period there, that'd be something we could talk about. But there isn't. But, the scripture says, another one of those famous buts, but when Peter saw the wind, he grew afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And right away, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, and he said these words, Peter, your faith is so small. Why did you doubt me? All right, right before this encounter with the woman who just won't quit, Jesus had been having a conversation with the Pharisees and then with the disciples about the topic of purity and defilement. Basically, what's clean, what's unclean, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. He says to the crowd and to the Pharisees, it's not what you swallow that makes you unclean, but what you vomit up. That's not nice. What does that mean? Here's how I read it. Being pure or clean is not determined by physical components, what you eat, how and when you wash your hands, how you slaughter the animal, what menu choices can be eaten together or must be eaten separately, and so on. Jesus is saying, it's not what and how you eat, but what you say and do with the life your diet supports. That's what determines your purity. For him to say that in his culture was heresy. It was heretical. It marked him. He was going to die. Jesus left Galilee and goes to Tyre and Sidon, the area northeast of Palestine. So geographically, we get a clue. Jesus is leaving what is clean, Galilee, and going to a place where everything is unclean, Tyre and Sidon. Jesus, who we know today, was uniquely fully human and also uniquely fully divine. Jesus, who was God, that's what the word incarnate means, had withdrawn to get away from the public and the crowds and the shoving and the demands. And here was this uppity woman causing the scene. And she was so persistent that the disciples finally said, Jesus, please help her. Not because their hearts were touched by her plea. Nothing quite so noble. Jesus, help her so she'll just shut up and go away. I've been there. 
whatever, just leave me alone. Jesus answers, we feed the children first before we feed the dogs. Actually, some translators would translate the word dogs as puppies. That makes it a little better. If you're teaching this in the fourth, four-year-old class, you talk about puppies. It's still mean. It's still condescending. You can get away with it because in Mark, he uses the word kinaria, which is the diminutive of kinos found in Matthew. It's sort of like the difference between ducks and ducklings. However, in this scripture, we're not talking about ducks. We're talking about dogs. Now, forgive me if this offends you, but it's difficult to really understand this scripture if you sanitize it and bleach out the original language Jesus used. Annie Dillard, who's one of my favorite authors, wrote that if we took the gospel seriously, we'd all come to church in crash helmets and there'd be seat belts in the pews. Maybe we don't take scripture seriously. Maybe that's why the changes we keep looking for aren't happening. Dog, in Jesus' day, was a very offensive term. I'm not sure in my memory I can ever imagine, I don't think I've ever heard this word in church. But hardly a day goes by that I don't hear it out there. In the streets, in the market, in the schools. When some, someone gets really angry with a woman, they go to this word. Get out of my way, you fill in the blank. We feed the children before we feed you, you. This Jesus is not nice. The woman's desperate. And here's the part I love. She's also smart. She takes Jesus' own words, the word that I'm not going to say in this sanctuary, and she uses it to come right back at him. Even the dog gets to eat the crumbs from the master's table. Do you have a dog? I do. When my son Anders was a baby, we had a hound dog named Tramp who would sit right under his high chair at every meal in hopes of catching every morsel that he would drop. Nothing ever hit the floor. That dog was on it. Even the puppy gets to eat the crumbs that fall from the table, she said. This foreigner, this woman, this dog of a Gentile was not going to let Jesus off the hook. She needed help, and she knew in her heart that Jesus was the only one who could help her, even though she was a woman, even though she was a Gentile, even though she was a dog from Canaan. She was banking on one thing. Jesus really was the Lord. And if Jesus really was the Lord, Jesus would help her. This woman knew something very important, some that we sometimes forget, something Peter was not absolutely sure about. If God is for us, God is for all of us. Because in God's view, there's only one us. There is no them. In God's perspective, the us versus them is a false dichotomy created because we sometimes have trouble dealing with who we are. And so we try to distinguish ourselves by saying we're not like them. And in our identity crisis, we forget something very important. We are all, all means everybody. We are all sinners saved by grace. The recipients of God's offer of reconciliation through Christ. And this is true for all of us. It's true, regardless of your IQ or your net worth or your pedigree or your bloodline or your tenure or your title, we are all sinners saved by grace. No matter what hell we've created for ourselves, no matter how many times we have been disappointed or disappointed others, no matter how many times we've been robbed of our dreams or like Esau, how many times we've traded away our futures, Matthew wants us to know in no uncertain time terms that God loves us, God is for us, God wants to be reconciled with us, with you, with me, and with that mother from Canaan. 
I see her as a single mother. I think I see her this way because if there'd been a father or a husband in that day and time, I think he would have been the one out there asking help from the new rabbi. I also see her as a person of limited resources. I see her as a person of no status. I mean, look how they treated her. That's how I see her. That's how I believe Jesus saw her at first. But, there's that but again. But then Jesus saw something else. Jesus gave her a second look. Jesus answered her question with a statement. Woman, great is your faith. Peter was standing nearby. Peter was always standing nearby. And I bet when he heard that, he remembered that just a short time before, Jesus had told him about how small his faith was. Woman, great is your faith. He might just as easily have said, oh, woman, you are faith. Faith is believing what is not yet. Faith with a steadfast heart and a dead-end job and a sick kid. Great is your faith. What did that mean? I think it's important to note that the woman knew she had a need. We all do, you know. We don't always like to admit it, but we're a pretty needy group. Some of us know it. Some of us don't, some of us pretend, but we're all needy in one way or another. That's why I often pray a prayer that goes something like this. Lord, you brought me here, you know my needs. Be with me when I know I need you, but be especially with me when I think I don't need you at all because that's when I'm the neediest of all. She knew. She knew if the world was divided between us and them, she was them, on the outside looking in. But she recognized Jesus was the Lord. It's interesting. Even though we're more than halfway through the Gospel of Matthew, this woman's the only, the second person to recognize and call Jesus Lord. And she doesn't just do it once. She does it three times. Why is that so important? Because do you remember that they had coins back then? And what was on the coin? A picture of Caesar. And you remember what it said around the coin? Caesar is Lord. For her to say Jesus is Lord was heretical. It marked her. She could have been killed for saying that. And she said it three times over and over again, Lord, Lord, Lord. She knew him as Lord, she trusted him as Lord, and she believed him as Lord. She was faith incarnate. If the gospel ever has to be reduced to its most common denominator, this is it. If you only remember one thing, this is it. If we wake you up in the middle of the night and we say, who are you, what are you? This is it, this is what you need to say. Jesus is Lord. That's it. Perhaps that's why this story was passed down in oral tradition and then told and retold in Mark and in Matthew. Again, I have to wonder how Peter the disciple felt when he remembered this story. He probably preached about this story. Remember Peter? The one who denied the lordship of Christ three times before the crock crowed? Twice, the cock crowed. Three times, Peter denied him. And yet this foreigner, this woman with a sick kid, calls Jesus Lord from beginning to end. Three times. Matthew and Mark tell us in the telling of this story, in the retelling of this story, that it is in the hopelessness of helplessness, the hopelessness of disastrous choices, the hopelessness of living out of pretense instead of living out of what is real. Even in all those situations, there is still real hope in Jesus, the Savior, who is Lord. Matthew knew the Old Testament. Matthew quoted the Hebrew scriptures. He knew that the Canaanites were the enemies of Israel. He also knew, because he remembered this event, this happening, this story, 
that Jesus on this day broke through the cultural prejudices of his day and reached out to help one of the others and in so doing discovered there never was a group called them. We are all part of that same needy group. We are all in need of God's love, God's healing, God's grace. The story is for us, for those of us who are women, for those of us who are mothers, for those of us who are church members, for those of us who claim to be followers and disciples of Jesus, for those of us who have taken our place in the body of Christ. This story is for us. There is no them and us in heaven. And if we want to live into the prayer Jesus taught us, remember the words, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? There should be no us and them on earth either. Our feet as disciples of Jesus are planted on earth, but as Christians, our hearts and our minds are always leaning, straining, reaching toward heaven. There was a young girl coloring a picture. And in her picture, the sun was purple and the mountains were pink and the grass was neon yellow. You stupid little girl, said her teacher. That's not the way things are. And the wise little girl never looked up, just kept on coloring as she said, I don't like the way things are. We're living in a world where the things, the way things are is not always the way things are supposed to be. But if we can envision a new world with eyes of faith, we can see God's vision. And perhaps we can be part of how God changes the world. Perhaps, perhaps we can introduce someone to a new world. Perhaps we can become what we behold when we look at Jesus. The reality is we live in a fragmented world of haves and have-nots, thems and uses. But just as real is God's call to us to be part of the family of God, to see ourselves and each other as God sees us, a family with one agenda, one faith, one Lord one future. We are being called by the one who has been faithful to us, not just to follow Jesus, but to imitate him, to do what Jesus did. And so that leaves us with the question, doesn't it? The text wins. It wins with this question. What hinders you from calling Jesus Lord and doing what he's asking you to do? Today you've been given a piece of paper. There should be one somewhere close to where you're sitting. Did you get these? Do you have them? Hold them up. If you don't have one, there's more on the front row here. There was once a woman struggling with a conviction. You know what a conviction is? It's a request from God that is persistent. It's like an itch that will not be resolved until we either do what the conviction asks us to do or stop whatever the conviction asks us to stop. And so she went to her pastor and she said, what should I do about this? And her pastor pulled a Jesus on her. He didn't tell her what to do. He did what Jesus often did. When people came and asked him questions, he responded with a question. You know what the question was? Is Jesus your Lord? Yes. Then you already know what to do. If Jesus is Lord, the only response is yes, Lord. Here's the deal. God has given us free will. We have the ability to choose. We can say no, and we can say yes. But if we are followers of Jesus, we can never say, no, Lord. That's the dilemma we all have, those of us who claim Jesus is Lord. We have free will to say yes or to say no. God made us that way. 
but we cannot say no, Lord. There's a Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator, which translates sinner saint simultaneously in tension, our two natures, in tension. And we have the potential each moment to be a saint or to be a sinner. To be a sinning saint and to be a saintly sinner, two sides of the same coin. We don't graduate from that status in this life. It is who we are. We are sinner saints. And when we say, yes, Lord, we demonstrate our sainthood. And when we say no to the Lord, we demonstrate our sin. The part of our life that's still being withheld from God. Here's my point. We can say no but we can't say no, Lord. Today, you may be struggling with something the Lord is calling you to do. Or maybe the Lord is calling you to stop doing something. During our time of invitation and commitment, if you're ready to respond to that conviction, we have a basket here. And you can bring up your response. Yes, Lord. And drop it in the basket. It's between you and God. But we offer you this public demonstration to help you remember what you and God decide today. You may not be ready to make that kind of decision. That's okay. I trust Kairos. That's God's timing. So you may want to hold on to this. And maybe a week from now or a month from now or 10 years from now, this goes in the offering plate. Because you finally said, yes, Lord. She was a single mom with a sick kid, a dead-end job, and she woke up that morning with one hope that Jesus could meet her need where she needed him the most. Jesus said yes to her. And when Jesus said yes to her, he said yes to all of us. And now the question is for us. How do we respond? Yes, Lord, or no? Amen.